Welcome everybody to the session today. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, you'll see on the screen a wee reminder uh, today just to turn off your camera um, and mute your microphone. Um, obviously I forgot to do that there. But there is going to be a recording made of this session as well. So it's just for your own comfort and things as well. Just remember to do that. Feel free to post comments, questions and thoughts into the chat window. And when we get to the discussion stage, we'll probably uh, edit that out of the final version of, of today's session. Um, I put a couple of things to do with accessibility as well. Feel free to turn on live captions um, um, if that is helpful to you. Um, and you can do that in the if you have a look on the top, there's a little bit with more actions and you can turn on live captions in that. It's the three dots or ellipses at the top there. So I'm just going to move on to this slide. Um, this is welcome to the Secondary Sciences Network. A huge part of this is about this model for network learning. And I'm sure you'll recognise the uh, model for professional uh, learning on the right hand side there and the left hand side, that model for network learning. Um, what we're hoping to do today is just to, to um, introduce you to some of the things that practitioners are doing. And today we're joined with uh, practitioners from Dingwall Academy who are going to be sharing their practice with us. And we've also got the opportunity to um, share and chat and perhaps create some new knowledge, some things that we want to learn about as well today. So I just popped that up there. Um, we are going to be using a Padlet as well today. So I'm going to pop that into the chat just now. And in the Padlet, there's a copy of the presentation that is being used today so you don't have to take lots of notes um, and there's also um, a couple of questions that the practitioners at Dingwall wanted to ask and there's also space for you to add other questions and comments as well or you can just pop them into the chat as we go. So my name is Janie Irving, um, I'm one of the STEM education officers with Education Scotland and joining me today from Education Scotland are Ian Menzies and Margaret Craw. Um, and joining us today from Dingwall Academy, we're going to hear from Rob, Andy and Michael as they tell us about their journey with their BGE course. And we're going to be diving into their data and what what they do with it. Um, a key aspect, I suppose, for us all to keep in mind today is thinking about what we want to assess in science and why um, and how we use the data that we collect to change our practice to improve feedback to our pupils and ultimately to support our learners progression throughout school. So unless there's any questions just now, um, and I'll pause for a wee second, um, if there's not without, I will hand over anything just now coming up. In that case, I will hand over to the team from Dingwall. Welcome, Andy. Hi, I'm Andy. Uh, can you move on to the next slide for me, please? That's wonderful. Thank you very much. OK, so a while ago we decided we were looking at our BGE course and we decided that we were doing end of unit tests and all we were doing was a pass or a fail based on whether they had managed to get greater than 50 percent in the test and that wasn't really giving us any real data about our students it wasn't giving us a full picture all we were really checking is their knowledge and understanding and problem solving skills so we decided to revamp our courses, keeping to what we were doing originally, which was six topics covered over the course of the year, two based around biology, two based around chemistry, and two based around physics. And then we decided what we wanted to do is we wanted to try and then create unit tests, which then tested their scientific skills at level three, level two, and moving on to extending it to level four. We wanted more, more than just knowledge and understanding. So we wanted something to put something in place that we could then help our students progress through the science courses. So we wanted to have something with some scaffolding in there, scaffold, scaffold, scaffolding in there so that we could help them to build up to become better scientists. And also we felt that the courses we were offering were not giving our students good access into the kind of skills that we needed them to be developing into S3 and into S4. So we weren't kind of giving them the right kind of skills for when they get into S4 and we're looking at AVUs and we're looking at assignments. We wanted to include some more scaffolding in those early years to help build into that. Okay, can you move on to the next slide for me, please? 
Okay, so what we decided to do is we decided that we were going to, first of all, introduce a standardized scientific write-up. And we were going to split this into various different levels, a level two, a level three, and a level four. We decided that what we'd have is slight, and we'd also introduce a scientific literacy task, which would also be split into level two, level three, and level four to introduce to our S1, S2 students as we move forward. We still continue to have an end of topic assessment where we are then monitoring their knowledge and understanding and problem style questions. But we split that down so we now have what we consider to be level two style questions, level three style questions. And we're now looking at introducing level four styles of questions into our assessments. Uh, so the scientific write-ups, we wanted to make sure that the scientific write-ups we were doing were standardized to give us good numerical data, which the students could then process. And we wanted our literacy tasks to be based on internet research in an aspect of science, which is relevant to the topic they were studying at that particular point in time. OK, can you move on to the next slide for me, please? OK, so at the moment we collect data and we enter that data into a spreadsheet. We basically, this is a typical example here on the screen of what we've got. We've got biology cycle one and cycle two. So that's the two topics in biology, chemistry and physics. And here we've got it broken down into level two style questions, level three style questions and problem solving questions. So to achieve a pass in any of the knowledge and understanding sections, then they need to score a certain score, which at the moment is sitting at seven out of a possible 10 to get a level two in knowledge and understanding. Same in the level three for knowledge and understanding. And in the problem solving, it depends on their marks, whether we mark them down as a level two or a level three. And the spreadsheet just basically works all of that out for us when we input the data from their tests. We also then, for reporting purposes, we wanted to include that into our reporting processes. So when a student has managed to pass level two knowledge and understanding on three occasions, that becomes a, a pass on their um, reporting to say that they are working at level two. And obviously when they get passes at six passes at level three, that moves on and gives them a level three on that section. And again, the same again when it comes to uh, problem solving so that we can then track exactly and our parents have access to this data as it is being used so they can see their pupils progress okay can you move on to the next slide for me please okay so here is a typical example of one of our level two uh, scientific write-ups so here you can see that what we've done to help scaffold it for the pupils is we've used missing words with a word bank to give them a chance when they're doing the experiment to work through this and to fill in the missing words as they are doing it. There is a table for them to collect data. There is information on safety. There is information on the actual method for the experiment and space included for them to draw a diagram. We have space for them to do a table, a conclusion and an evaluation as they work through. And once they've completed this successfully three times, they've got a tick in each of those sections and then they can move on to the next level okay so can we move on to the next slide for me please okay here we go level three inquiry we see now the level of scaffolding has been reduced again we're still using those missing words exercises but they no longer have a word bank so they're trying to they have to put the correct words into there on the table on the graph we have no information input on the table and no information put into the graph so again they have to put that information on as they work their way through. And then can you move on to the next slide for me, please? Our level fours are based on the national four outcome one. So we're using, they just get a blank piece of paper and then they are expected to write out the scientific write-up going through all of the normal procedures, the aim, the variables, safety, method, results with a table uh, and a graph and then a conclusion and an evaluation on the experiment. Okay, if we can just move on to the next slide for me, please. Here are some examples of our scientific literacy skills. So here we're looking, students have level two 
level three criteria when they're in S1. And in S2, we move on and we introduce the level four criteria because some of our students, as they're getting into S2, are getting to that kind of level four just there. So you can see there is a step up in complexity between each level. Uh, can we move on to the next slide? And I'll pass you over to my colleague, Michael, who's going to go through how we use this data. Good afternoon, folks. Hi, my name is Michael Sharkey. I'm a physics teacher at uh, Dingwall Academy. Uh, I'm going to spend a few minutes telling you about how we use SNSA data uh, to inform our practice here at Dingwall. Um, so, yeah, to start off with then, obviously the SNSA data comes from the P7 information. So um, it's really used as our base level when our S1 classes come in. Um, we have um, this data at our fingertips and it allows us to adjust our practice based on what we see. So if I take my class, for example, um, like most of us, I'm sure we have a widespread of abilities and we can see that in the SNSA data. Um, I was more used to, to Soska, to be honest, and of course in the last few years it's been replaced with the SNSA um, information. So. Um, on the website, uh, we we look at uh, the banding and in particular the descriptions of the uh, of the bands. So at uh, P6, sorry P7 level, they should be between bands uh, six to eleven, and there are really nice uh, exemplifications of what we can expect um, for pupils to be able to achieve. Uh, through numeracy, reading, and writing at these levels. So being a physicist, um, I obviously go straight for the numeracy um, outcomes. Uh, straight away and within my class I've got um, four pupils who are um, band 11 top of the pile and then I've also got pupils um, who are uh, around about the band six so of course we're um, talking about a widespread of uh, numeracy ability and of course because of that this is where as Andy said the scaffolding um, comes in so to kind of put it in perspective um, you know you know yourselves when they come in we're looking for such skills as averaging interpretation of graphs um in the past this was always something we'd be hoping um, for the p7s to be coming in with um i'm certainly seeing at this stage due to the last two years of disruption that were the i would say the bands are coming in lower and because of that um we are at a point where we're having to teach these uh, numeracy skills, the band 10 and 11 skills, so the percentages, the averaging. Um, and this kind of throws up a few problems. I know in the past I'd always expected pupils to be coming in with these skills already. So I'm finding myself um, having to teach uh, averaging and percentages um, a lot more. So we've had quite a lot of liaison with the, the maths department, making sure that our approach is consistent to the way that we teach these numeracy skills. Um, yeah, um, on top of that, as Andy showed you, we have, um, for example, our, our write-up sheets. We've got support scaffolding to, to help the, the band six pupils and extension materials uh, going into the level four for our band 11. So it's that kind of base level that allows us straight in week number one, we can um, adjust, um, differentiate our learning. Um, so that everyone is catered for. In terms of the reading and writing um, bands, um, obviously, as you saw there with Andy, we had the uh, investigated write-ups. So we know straight away, is it level two, is it level three uh, that we're going to be giving the kids? What level of scaffolding is required? Um, yeah, uh, Could you put on the next slide, please? Thank you. Okay, so um, we had a meeting with uh, Janie uh, recently and we were looking at this very powerful package. I'm really excited to um, get to use it uh, called Power B. We've not had a go at using it yet, but um, you can see here, these are our um, current fourth years. And these were um, some of their um, scores when they were in P7. Um, so you can see it gives you a really nice snapshot of their numeracy uh, writing and reading skills for the cohort. And immediately you can see as scientists, it's jumping out at us um, that the numeracy skills, uh, we've got this big um, 91 
uh, in the middle um, bracket, which really compared to the read and writing, it should be a bit more, um, a bit lower than that for the, the Ambers. So I guess it's not so much a, a whole class thing. This is more as a school and an ASG. How can we um, interpret these results and put things into place um, to, to work on um, these uh, numeracy skills? So yeah, that's some of the ways in which we use the SNSA data. Um, thank you very much. I'll pass over to Rob to uh, take it from you. Thank you very much. Hi there, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Rob Urquhart, a chemistry teacher here at Bingo. Um And I've been kind of looking into, um, in the last few months, um, how we sort of use some of our data and how we can get a bit more information out of it. If we could move on to the next slide, please. Um, again, as Michael said there, we've been introduced to this Power BI software, and this shows us a bit of what it can do. Um, we, as uh, Andy showed you, we've been using um, a more traditional method of uh, numbers in a, in a spreadsheet. Um, but we use it for all the same things that you guys obviously do as well, so our, our tracking and monitoring, monitoring pupil progress. Um, and of course, most importantly, um, informing next steps for learning um, and reporting and feedback to pupils and parents, making interventions when we need to um, and identifying strengths and weaknesses with pupils. Um, and this shows some data for an anonymous uh, pupil of ours across their first and second year um, tests in each of the three subjects, which gives a really good re uh, visual representation and um, makes that the data that we've collected on them much easier to kind of access, but also easier uh, to to show pupils how they're doing, how their progress is, and what they need to work on. Um, if we could move on to the next slide, please. Um, similarly, we have data from our um, skills, so from our, our investigative write-up skills, and we can see here this is data that's been collected for um, a whole year group. Um, at level two and looking at um, the total sum of marks across a year group in each of this of the, the sections that we're marking them against and um, while they complete their their write-ups and um, we can see that um, presenting data and tables and graphs and identifying um, variables that they have to um, work with and within each of their um, investigations seems to be slightly weaker than, than other areas, some, such as maybe like writing methods, contributing to their procedure, coming up with an aim. So um, as my colleagues have, have said, obviously we can use this to inform next steps, we can use this to identify the sort of scaffolding that we're using and who needs extra help, and then ultimately the, the sort of level of progress that they're working at and the, the levels that they've achieved. If we could move on to the next slide, please. Um, personally, over the last um, the last couple of months, um, I've been looking into um, the the level of challenge within our tests across BGE. Um, now we can see here that um, there's obviously a, a sort of a deviation of um, sort of average scores at, at each level within um, knowledge and understanding and, and problem solving. And when marking tests, I noticed that there were a number of pupils that were um, scoring kind of like flipped results, if you like. They were, they were scoring higher in their level three section of their tests um, compared to the level two. So speaking to colleagues to see if anyone else was noticing similar things, we started delving into some of our um, sort of historic data to see whether um, it was an issue with our tests or whether it was down to something else. Um, so we've been using this data to, to ultimately work on an internal sort of moderation exercise um, to check our tests against themselves. What we've looked at is um, averaging um, results for the past three year groups. And obviously we have to acknowledge that um, there has been disruption. Um, we do have um, for some areas of the of BGE over the last couple of years, um, you know, gaps in our data um, from when there may have been distant learning and whatnot. But using the data that we have got, um, we've averaged scores from year groups in each test and then looked at um, how they differ from each other across each year group to try and 
normalise our own BGE tests against themselves to try to um, ensure that we've got the same level of challenge at all of our level two test questions across all of our BGE um, tests and the same at level three and the same at our problem solving. And we have found that from the data that we have, we you know we have um, a level of um, of deviation across that. So it's something that we're looking into at the moment, whether some need to be made more challenging or some need to possibly be made um, a little less challenging. And that has led us on to questioning whether our approach, um, how, how, how strong and effective our approach is and how other people are are taking um, or how other people are, are working um, with this as well. Could you move on to the next slide, please? So ultimately, this has raised questions um, within our department, which is why um, we've kind of uh, put this presentation together and ultimately want to kind of um, open a, a conversation with colleagues um, across the country and see what everyone else is doing as well. Um, of course, we use the benchmarks for guidance, but ultimately our questions are, um, you know, We've we've presented to you today how we are going about it, but we completely understand there is no um, standardised sort of method of assessing or tracking BGE. Um, so what are other people doing? Um, how are other people collecting data? And um, how are people deciding what constitutes level two or level three? As you've seen today, we are um, constructing our test with level two questions and level three questions. Um, and problem solving questions. Are there other people taking a more holistic approach or are there other people following a similar structure to ourselves? Um, at what stage are other people um, or other schools deciding that a level has been achieved? Um, and these are things that we would love to, to hear about from other schools and, and ultimately try to sort of hone our own approach and, and hopefully maybe, you know, contribute to other people's approach as well. So thank you very much. Um, for, for listening to us talking about what we do here at Dingwall um, and hopefully um, we can share some good interesting information with each other to help everyone out. Thanks so much. Um, I'm just going to uh, go back a couple of slides as well because there's been a few questions in the chat around just the, the Power BI programme itself. So I'll maybe um, allow Margaret and myself, we can maybe just handle a few of those questions and then we'll, we'll go on to the questions from the team. Um, so... Uh, Margaret, do you want to come in and just explain a bit about yeah. what you did? Yeah, I, I think I think that there's two clear aspects here. I think the really important part about about this um, session today is about the approach of using data in order to to look at our next steps, is interrogating what we've got, and then looking at it. And then there's that side part, which is the which is the, the, the sort of nice geeky part, which is you know what you use in order to to harvest and and, and elevate that data to something that's a wee bit more visual. So that's the the nuts and bolts, is the mechanics of the power. BI, but really what's at the heart of this whole session today is the approach that Dingwall have taken and saying, you know what, we get numbers, we get all this data, but what's it actually telling us and what are we going to do about it in order to inform our next steps to, to help our learners and to help us um, move on our, our journey of, of, of looking at the um, our assessments and things like that and, and also to look at your demographics in front of you. So um, Janie's got up here, thanks Janie for that, we've got up here the, the SNASA data. So um, straight away when we looked at this NASA data and you know what it's like if you look in, in Excel you get you get all of this data there and it's all in you might have 200 people or 240 people in a, in a cohort for one year group and the numbers are populated there and uh, yeah that, that looks great but unless you actually have a, a, a sort of mind like an IBM computer it is quite hard to, um, to, to, to use that data so what we've done is we've just used a, a, a program that that, that can easily do this, and Excel can do that as well. But this is this is a really good way of of, of um, being able to show that. So in a school, if I was looking at SNASA data that was coming in, I get my cohort coming to me in in August September. I already know that this cohort um, I've got. You know, you can see there the difference in numeracy. You can see the difference in the difference in reading and in writing. And um, looking at the then the demographics within your um, your class. You, you know 
that when you are setting um, setting your your first homeworks or your your first learning experiences in the class, and also any assessments, that if some of the questions are around numeracy, and you know that these certain individuals within your class set um, has a, you know have have scored a little bit less in the SNASA data, then that's not that's not uh, new data to you, but it does explain a little bit. So therefore, it helps you to say, should I therefore be putting in that little bit of scaffolding? around some of their, their homework and assessments. Um, it gives you a clearer picture of where that, that learner is, but also gives you an absolute clearer picture that if they move um, from, say, a 4 out of 10 in a problem solving to a 6 out of 10, that's a huge success for that learner. And that's the, the success we should be celebrating. Jenny, I don't know if you want to say any more about the SNASA data here. Uh, not specifically. Um, the one that I picked out that, that that really resonated with me personally when I when I looked at uh, at your data was around the was around uh, the information around the um, uh, practical write up um, mm. because again I'm just sort of thinking back to as a class teacher if I was to look at this and again uh, I I. I admit, I just, I really do like a graph. I find it just much easier to have a visual to actually to see what's happening. And I know that I would use this to perhaps, particularly if I was looking at my my individual class, to think, okay, right, I can see that there's certain aspects of this process that they are, that the, my pupils are coping well with, they are making good progress with. Are there particular things that I want to pick up on? And I think that's the sort of things that, that, that were being discussed today. You know, for example, the, the sort of presenting data was a, an area that, um, Dingwall were saying, you know, we felt that we were going to have to do more work around that in particular over this with this particular cohort, um, but things like variables as well. And again, and I always come back to, um, and I, I was very pleased when I hear Dingwall saying about, you know, that clustered approach and things as well about, you know, having that common language, particularly around something like scientific inquiry skills can be so valuable as a way to uh, support learners all the way from early level to fourth level. Um, so with things like variables and things like that, how do we introduce that? When does that in get introduced? When do we start talking using like your independent, dependent variables and so on? Um, I've just spotted actually that a question's come in. So I just wanted to put that to the teachers at Dingwall. Uh, it's from Angela, just saying very interesting and asking if the whole class does the level two investigation template three times and wondering about stretch and challenge would some pupils already be able to do level three so um, I'm just wondering who wants to pick up on that question from Dingwall oh. sorry it was we missed that yeah that's all right. As Davis popped in, actually something in there as well, that every pupil starts with level two and a number of pupils have progressed to level three by partway through S1. So that's, they're not sort of staying at a particular level if they're clearly uh, rocking through that. And again, I suppose you might have an idea of who might um, be able to make that progress quite quickly using the, this NASA data and things as well. Um, folks, I have put into the chat as well the, the Padlet but I also am aware that it's maybe just a good time to have an opportunity to chat. So I'm actually going to, unless Margaret wants to pick up on another aspect of the data that was shown here, I was maybe going to stop presenting. So Margaret, is there anything else you wanted to pick up on? No, I think I think everything's really been um, talked about. I think it'd be really interesting to hear the discussion and get people talking about how they use data and um, asking questions back to Dingwall. Um, so yeah, let's let's go on with the, the, the crack, really. Okay. So, um, as I said, I've popped the Padlet into the chat. It might be helpful to, to bring this up for yourself um, or you can use the, the just the chat function if it's easier. There's a, a number of questions that uh, my colleague Ding was asking in terms of uh, what data are you collecting? How do we decide on level two or three questions? So let's just um, see. Now, 